about uh, Stacy Osborne. Tracy Osborne, goodness, sorry, four o'clock coffee. Um, because uh, my first language was condescension. <laughs> and, and she said that she describes herself as a designer, developer, entrepreneur because it sounds really pretentious. And I'm like, I gotcha. So here we go. Yay! So I was a little backwards. I call myself entrepreneur because that's cooler. Oh. Yeah, nerd. Sorry. All right, hi everyone, I'm Tracy. I have this up here because inevitably every single conference I go to, I'm like, hey, follow me on Twitter. And everyone thinks I'm Lime Darling. And I have that Twitter account and there's 25 followers on it. And it says everywhere, Lime Daring, Lime Daring, Lime Daring. So FYI, I'm just telling people immediately in the beginning, Lime Daring, not Darling. Follow me, I'm hilarious. <laughs> Everyone's like, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just started working at a company called Dream Factory. We're an open source API platform, which is awesome because my first task is actually to update all of their documentation. So I was like, and I started, uh, I got invited to speak here before I started working this company. And I'm like, sweet, twofer. I'm going to learn my, about documentation, um, talk, my, talk about documentation up here, and then applies directly to this company has just hired me. Thank you, Dream Factory. But this talk was really about my work with the books I wrote. Um, I wrote a couple books on basically an intro to web app development using Python and Django. And I wrote these books because of pretty much my background, where I originally went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and, woo, -woo <laughs> learn by doing. <laughs> I went to Cal Poly, and I have an art degree with a uh, concentration in graphic design. And the thing I don't usually tell people is that I actually went to Cal Poly for computer science. So, like, day one, hour one, going into Cal Poly, I, I, in high school I did web pages, I did websites, I was framed websites, and I'm like, I'm a programmer. So I applied for computer science, and I got accepted, went to Cal Poly, sat down in my first CSE 101 class, and had this spent like the hour of doom going, holy crap, what, why am I here? This is not what I'm supposed to be. Like, it was a very awful introduction to computer science. I think a lot of it has to do because like an intro to computer science, it was in Java. And now I know that for my first language, that may have been not the best thing. <sighs> so I thought, okay, you know what? Programming, not my thing. I hate programming. I switched over to an art degree. I was going to become a package designer. Uh, but I ended up jumping back into web um, as a graphic designer and worked for about four years until I decided that I really wanted to work for myself and build my own thing, thus the entrepreneur. So originally I was kind of like, okay, I hate programming. I hate programming. Programming is awful. I'm never going to do it again. So I need to go find my technical co-founder. Uh, and long story short, I have so many stories about this. Ask me, about, ask me about them later. That didn't work out. So I, said, I had to look at programming again, discovered Python, and Python was way easier for me to pick up. I ended up launching this little web app, uh, wrote some blog posts about it, and this was about six years ago, and that up until last few months when I started working at uh, Dream Factory, this was my full-time job of working on this startup. I designed, developed, built everything from scratch, and it's really fulfilling, it was a really fun thing to work on, especially because I thought I hated programming, I was never going to program again, and I fell in love with Python. And this is the startup now, it's called Wedding Lovely. So the books are here really because as I was teaching myself how to program Python, and I have, again, this like fear of programming and this fear of, like, of like how much I hated that experience in academic programming. As I taught myself Python, I kind of thought to myself, why the hell was it taught this way when I think it should be taught this way? So after six years of working for myself, I decided to write these books and finally write the resource that I wish existed and did a couple Kickstarter campaigns and now they're on Amazon with like positive reviews, which is awesome. And one of the most fulfilling things has been running workshops 
whoops, there we go. There's one workshop photo, another one. And working with beginners and talking to them and talking to them about their experiences of people jumping into programming and realizing that I'm glad I wrote these books. I wrote these books really because I wanted to write the resource that I wish existed for me. And there was a lot of other people out there who had the same experience as me and that this book helped them out. And look, someone's writing my, reading my book. It's amazing. This is the best feeling in the world. The thing is, I'm like, I, I now speak at conferences. I speak at programming conferences. I've written two programming books. I give workshops at programming conferences. I'm giving a workshop next Saturday at PyCon. I've given community workshops. I still feel like a complete noob <laughs> when it comes to programming. I've been running this, uh, this website, and I was running, I built the entire thing, like 11 different properties. You know, I mean, it's all using Django and everything like that, but I am this weird spot where I am like a good programmer in a lot of different ways, but still a beginner in many, many others. And I still go to documentation and read tutorials and, and whatnot, and I, even though I should be an expert at this point, get completely baffled when I read documentation that's aimed at someone who's supposed to be like me, um, but is written for a level higher than I am. And that kind of thing, even though I should be up here, and be, I should be going to these places and feeling like an expert and feeling like a really good programmer, um, I still feel excluded from a lot of different projects because I am, I am such a dork and I don't understand what's going on. For example, I was at OzCon last week and someone was talking to me at ORMs. And now everyone who's a programmer probably knows what an ORM is. I still really can't tell you, even though I've been working in Django, and I know Django has an ORM, but I can't explain to you exactly what it is. Because for me, I build web apps. And I tell Django to do this, and it builds these sites um, for me. I don't deal with terms like ORM. One thing, like, when it comes to documentation, is that there's a lot of people who are out there who are like me, people who are like experts but not the same level as the person who is writing this documentation. I find a lot of people who are writing documentation are writing it for people like them. And when your documentation, and I'll talk a little bit about how to do this, when your documentation accepts that, even if it's expert level, can open up to more beginners, more newbies, people like me, you're going to get more users more less support, less support requests, more contributors. And that's all why we're here. This is like this whole conference. So it's kind of like, yes, speaking to the right crowd. So I want to talk to you about writing in a way that your documentation can be more accessible to people of all levels. And writing documentation that you know, is a little bit more open, a little bit more friendly to people who might think themselves are experts like me, but maybe don't feel like it. Now, I'm a designer, and I want to say that I'm going to talk about specifically in content, not design, because I started working on this talk, and I just fell into a rabbit hole. I'm like, I have so much to say about design of, <laughs> of, of documentation. Like, please design your sites better. Um, maybe next year I'll do a talk on that. And the other thing is I, we're not, I'm not going to talk about grammar, because I, am, I can't even speak right. Not sure if anyone notices, but I kind of just I can't even talk like a normal person. I can't write like a normal person. <laughs> so FYI, I'm just going to put that out there. So how do we make documentation easy to read and enjoyable, make it accessible to people of all levels? So first part, basics of friendly and welcoming writing. So like I said, remember the readers aren't you. So many people, I talk to people and they say, okay, I'm writing, I make this project, and this project is for people who already know all of these things, and people who already know these things are people like me, so I'm going to write for me. Uh, and they'll write their documentation thinking of their own experiences and things that they know and things that they, um, they already understand. But like I said, there's a lot of people who might come to your project that have completely different experiences. People who might be building web apps instead of like are like super awesome, amazing programmers. So the first step for being more friendly, welcoming, and opening to beginners and every people of all levels is to write like a human, not a machine. So that's why there's a line here of like human versus machine, and I go way far to a ridiculous extent on the other side. So this is my dedication for my book, where I not only use words that don't exist, like the word support but I also talk about peeing. <laughs> 
all in my documentation, or excuse me, my documentation, my, my dedication for my book. This is extremely, actually, this is strategic, because I wanted someone who comes to my book, I'm specifically talking to beginners, I want people to open my book, read this, and realize that this book does not take itself seriously. That I am a human, I am talking to you like a human. You know, you might not know what Saporpus is, my husband does, you can ask me that later. Uh, but you'll realize that this book does not take itself seriously, and it becomes a little bit more accessible. So the content of the book, though, you know, is a little bit more serious, of course. But still, in the book, I, I deliberately put in a lot of things like woohoos and little encouraging tidbits to, again, act like I'm talking to someone, instructing them about programming, not just telling them about it. Like it's someone, I'm sitting next to someone and I'm cheering along with them, you know, side by side. A lot of people, like my second book, I hired a, uh, an editor, and she did have a little bit of an issue about this. She wanted me to take those things out and write professionally and write kind of dryly. I find that this, like that's a best practice. I'm not a big fan of best practices. I find this is way more accessible to more people. When you write like a human, you add these little fun little bits and like uh, humanism type things, it makes more sense and it thinks, makes it more friendly and welcoming. But, of course, you know, don't try to like, go too far into human adding some clever things because cultural references won't translate. I love requests, um, Kenneth Reitz is a friend of mine. However, the very first line of the documentation here says, requests is the only non-GMO HTTP library for Python safe for human consumption. So if you know what GMOs are, you know that it's like, Safe for human consumption. You're kind of like, oh, ha, ha, he's making a joke. But what if someone took this seriously and was kind of like, are there HDP libraries that are not safe for human consumption? Like, it just as the first line of documentation, that cleverness is kind of hard to translate. It can create more confusion than the joy it brings. So one of the easiest ways to start talking to someone like a human is to try a personas. Create a character in your head as you're writing it, and write as if you're speaking to them. So for example, you can say, hey, Fred, in my head, Fred is a designer working on his first programming project. So what would he need to know? And keeping this kind of writing style in your head will make it easier for you to write like a human, write like, some, like, like you're sitting next to someone and walking them through your project or your documentation than it would be to be writing like a machine. So. Back to requests, they do a really good job of this on other pages. You know, this documentation discusses various forms of authentication with requests. Many web services require authentication, and there's many different types. Below, we have outlined various forms of authentication available in requests from simple to complex. This is simple. This is easy to understand. feels more human. It's still extremely professional. Now, caveat on this example, this is actually the project that my husband wrote. Uh, so this is all of his documentation. I found this completely by accident, so I'm just gonna give him a shout out while I'm here. Because he has up here, um, this is on the PyPI, so not even a place where people usually put a lot of documentation. This is where you install the project. Uh, but it says, hey, go to eurolib3.readadocs.org for nice syntax highlighted examples, but long, long story short, here is an example. Now, long story short, it's kind of a little, you know, clever, uh, might not translate, but really this is writing like a human. This is writing like you're talking to someone and walking them through this. So remember that terms that are obvious to you might not be obvious to others. And this is something I run into all the freaking time, like I said, with ORMs, which I really should understand, but I don't, even though I've been running this Django website for the last six years. So in the other world of recipes, if you're not a cook, there are so many words that are used in people who are writing recipes that make no sense if you're not a cook. Uh, and you know, enough that BuzzFeed even writes a whole article on it. So there's terms in cooking, like cream the butter. And if, you, again, if you don't know this term, you might be thinking, cream the butter? Isn't butter already cream? It's just more solid? Do I take it back to a liquid state? Like, what the hell does cream the butter mean? Trust the bird, fold the egg whites, shock, or render the fat. And then my most favorite one is shock the vegetables. It's like, ha! Huh! <laughs> Wake up, vegetables. 
So if you're new to recipes, <laughs> you might be looking at these terms and being like, what the hell? You know, and recipes are really bad about this. And there's no way that you're going to be reading a recipe and someone's going to try to explain what these terms are. Well, I guess some of them do. But most of them are just kind of like, hey, if you don't know what this term is, you can go look it up by yourself. But I'm a recipe, and I'm not accessible to most people. Uh, but we don't have to be like that in documentation. So if there's anything that, any term that you're referencing that you don't want to explain in your documentation, because I guess that adds more work, link to things you don't want to explain. So for example, I'm learning my job, my new job, they're on PHP, so I'm trying to learn um, Laravel and PHP and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of a step back from my Python work, but you know, I'm getting there. And going on the docs for Laravel, it says Laravel utilizes Composer. Now when there is a link there, that's telling me the document, the, doc, the person who wrote this documentation says, hey, you might not know what this is. And I'll link out to this extra resource so you can go, you know, tab it open and open it in another tab and read about um, what Composer is. They're expecting that, hey, you might not know what this means. If Composer wasn't linked, it is telling me that the person writing the documentation expected me to know what that term is. And that's kind of a, a negative signal when I'm reading documentation. If I don't know what that term is, it's telling me that this documentation, that this project is not for me. Whereas, if it was linked, I can go learn about that and still use a project um, by just educating myself a little bit more. So, famous blog post, I, I started working on this, this talk and then I found this blog post everywhere. So if you haven't read it, I'll tweet it out later, but if you haven't read it, it's really important writing documentation um, is to teach, don't tell. And this is the power of having tutorials in documentation. Because you might be saying, hey, this person coming to my project, they really should go read the source or go read the wiki. Um, but if you can walk someone through your project and kind of handhold them into your project, then they can go and read your source. Because reading the source only really works for someone who's already familiar with your project. And your documentation is supposed to get Get, to, get them to that point. Django REST framework, the Django ecosystem, does a really good job in this. There are so many different types of tutorials that are on the project site. And this is really great because, I mean, it walks you through not just like working with Django REST framework, but it also walks you through the whole point of like the whole part of um, starting to work with that project. It's hand -holding. it's really great. Like I kind of wish that you know, explains what virtual end of it is, just in case someone gets to there and for some reason hasn't used that project. Um, but otherwise, they do a really good job of having tutorials and walking people through and introducing them to the project. So with my books, I sometimes fall into the trap of calling, saying that my books is Django dumbed down, which is kind of stupid. I shouldn't say that because dumb is like such a bad word. I'm not saying I'm dumb, not saying my books are dumb, not saying people reading my books are dumb. But it's really, really great when you can simplify the content you have, um, when you can take your, your pages, make them more simple, make them easier to understand. So like, dumb them down, but they're not dumb. For example, the fabric documentation, right at the top has a really good explanation about what fabric is and kind of walks, them, walks the reader through this project, what it's good for, what it could be used for. Now we'll go back. There we go. And then at the bottom, it has really easy examples to get someone started working at the project. I find with my books, my books are really small. And a lot of it has to do with um, getting someone to a success moment as early as possible, getting someone feeling successful with the project, because that's going to get them to use your project more, or your book, or whatever. So if you have the ability to get to give a really short example so someone can try out your project and get them to the feeling of like, oh, wow, I actually did something, vastly increases the chance that they're going to do more. So I've used Stripe, and they have this really awesome little walkthrough on their website. Uh, it started filling out immediately, and so you see the animation, and then it says, hey, copy-paste this little bit in to your command line. And then it comes back with JSON, and then the website automatically updates itself and says, hey, paste this in, paste it in. You're not writing any code. 
but you're seeing the power of Stripe right there. This is like total magic. It's a really cool thing that Stripe is doing. And at the end, after you pasted all those, those bits in and got the JSON responses, it gives you links to move forward. Stripe helps people to get to a success moment, to feel a bit of success with their projects, um, and get started working with them like early on, and then gets them feeling good, and then tells them where to go next. And it's really, really smart, even for a complex product. Another way to be welcoming and open to people is to obviously, I hope, to use general neutral language. As a chick, I do notice when documentation says he, him, et cetera, so forth, and immediately makes me feel like I am not the, re not the reader this person intended. And it's also good, because you can avoid a lot of controversy. I thought about animating this, so you can see like the 20 or so pages that this controversy went down. But it's very important. Uh, because again, someone might be tempted to do write for someone just like them, and they are happen to be male, and they write for other males, but that's very exclusionary to females or other genders. So there is a lot of good writing on this topic. This website is fantastic, uh, mainly because it has what I love in um, any kind of examples where it has lots of bad examples, good examples, makes it really easy. If someone's saying, I don't know how to rewrite this sentence to take out gendered pronouns, this website is amazing. And I'll tweet it out later as well. So second part, talking about content and the basics of writing clearly. When you're writing, I have a, whole, I have a design talk I usually give at different conferences. And a lot of times, uh, excuse me, a lot, design talk I usually give, and I talk about clutter, and paragraphs are a sign of clutter. Long, big paragraphs with lots and lots of sentences are really scary to a reader, and we're in the world of skimmers. So, A, if you can, try, whenever you see a big paragraph of content, try to cut that down to like two or three sentences. Um, actually, that's supposed to be per paragraph. And if you can't cut down and simplify your content, Break it into bullets and use lots of headers. Make your content easy to skim. And use italics and bolding to break up paragraphs. For example, the, one, the paragraph on the left, really hard to read at a glance. It's really hard. You can go line by line, but it's not something you really want to do. But if it's a lot easier to see the different lines in, this, um, in the paragraph once you break it out into bullets. And then you can take those bullets and make it further, even more readable, more skimmable, more accessible to your readers, and more enjoyable to read by adding some bolding. And bold the most important parts of the sentence so someone can you know, come to this page, they can see the bolded parts, see something that's important, and then they can read further. And if you have the ability, it's even better if then you can add some white space in between those bullets to further aid readability. Simplify language. You know, this goes hand in hand with, you know, two, three sentences per paragraph. But taking those words, you know, throw out the thesaurus. Don't try to sound smart. Try to, like, use as simple words as possible. And the biggest advantage to something like this is that, say, if someone goes um, to your website and they're from a different language and C Google Chrome says, hey, would you like to translate this into so-and-so language? If you have a lot of, uh, of Words that are hard to translate, it's going to be harder for people to read your content. So not only is it better to write more simple, write more plainly, write more like a human, uh, but it also aids people from different languages. And another thing about content, I'll say as a designer, uh, don't forget your headlines. A lot of the this headlines in your project not only are going to be aiding people from using your project, but documentation is also a little bit like marketing. So A, make sure that you have short, sweet, easy, simplified headlines, but also make sure that they are talking more about the benefits to the person reading than the, feed, than, um, the details. So for example, you know, this is my website, it's not my documentation, but this is really what my books are about. They're an introduction to building web apps using Python and Django. But really, this is what this does for the person. No, oh, go back. There we go. This is what it goes, back, goes for the person. Like, this is what it does for someone reading it. It helps someone learn how to build a web app. So this goes straight for documentation, for your headlines. You know, you can talk less if you can, especially on your, your introduction 
to your project, your documentation. Talk less about what it is about, but how this documentation is going to help someone. Next, um, quick a uh, little bit about style nitpicks is talking about code snippets. Make sure that they're styled differently. So a lot of like hosting services for code do this automatically for you, especially if you write up in Markdown and you mark it down as mark it up as code. And I'm gonna call myself out because in my book I have the code snippets all in blue. And I did that designery decision because I was like, oh this looks a little like rather than tons of colors that you're flipping through, everything is in this lovely blue with bolding for um, inserts. But I mean, the um, code snippets within the content, that permanent is a monospaced font, uh, and everything's a monospaced font. So at least it looks different than the rest of the content. And having code different from the rest of your content will vastly aid someone trying to go through and skim and find the content they need. Ideally, you'd be doing something like this, where you have code highlighting. Code highlighting is so important, and it makes it so much easier to read. So I'll, that is something I'll probably go do in like version three of my book, so I have to go through and redo all my code segments. Uh, I miss doing that, but take advantage of code highlighting as much as possible, because that really makes it easier for someone, um, especially as a new programmer, to read your content. And if you can, I don't see this a lot, but if you can, try to add file names to your code blocks, if it makes sense. Because files obviously can change names, um, it might be kind of hard to do this. So again, going back to Django, you have like a file for your views, you have a file for models, and generally, um, by default, they're views up high and models up high, and so I take advantage of that um, in my book, or you know, base.html for templates. But you know, your views file could change to be like content views.py or, uh, admin views.py, so you might be tempted to leave off those file names. But some, for someone who is new to programming that's just looking through your content and your um, documentation, having those file names is kind of a reassurance to let them know approximately where this content's gonna go. And Django does this otherwise, like URLs of pi, URLs of pi. So if you can, you know, add, like, letting people know that it's going to be, like, a base HTML template or it's going to be their uh, contact form template or their views template. I find this helps out people so much when they're beginner programmers, just reassuring them that this is where this code snippet is supposed to go. Then, last but not least, document with pictures as much as possible. Shopify does a really good job of this. Shopify um, has their click to create a store and you could just say, hey, click to create a store and then just move on with the rest of the documentation. But they have a photo, or excuse me, a screenshot of their website where it says, hey, here's the button, create a new store. I'm a visual person. And so seeing this, this screenshot actually just kind of, it better adheres my brain where this button is. So then when I go onto the website, I'm like, boom, there it is. Shopify goes a little bit further um, and they have animated GIFs, which I thought was really cool too because it says, hey, click on settings, then click on here. And then you have a little GIF showing you, click on settings, clicking on here. This is super cool. I wish more people did that. So in conclusion, so I talked a lot of little nitpicky things about content and updating uh, documentation to be more accessible. The main thing I want to emphasize is that even though you might have an expert level project, you might be aiming at other expo expert levels of other people who you might think are expert levels. People have different uh, levels of expertise in so many different areas. It's not just like one expert level has the same background as everyone else. For me, I've been running a website for so long. I've written books, I'm talking at conferences, these Python conferences, and yet I'm still asking silly questions like what's an ORM? By, being, by taking your projects and making sure that even your um, intermediate expert level projects are more accessible to beginners, by just giving them some hand-holding, letting people know um, that they're welcome, making sure that they have links to things they might not know, really helps the ecosystem, makes things a lot more welcoming and opening to people. Um, because so many people are jumping into this tech world from so many different areas and exper um, experiences. Not everyone has a computer science degree. I certainly don't, and I probably could never go back <laughs> and get one. Maybe someday. I was going through this whole job search thing, and people were like, hey, you should go like, apply for Google. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure Google does not want me. <laughs> so 
Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.